born a royal spare, grew up with a humiliating physical disorder, plagued by a speech impediment and ignored by his father. The young Prince Charles, who had later plunged the country into a bloody civil war, did not have the easiest of childhoods. Welcome to the English Civil Wars, a series from History Workshops, covering everything and anything connected to the War of the Three Kingdoms. We'll be looking at the causes, the battles, the characters, the weapons and tactics, religion, and even the role of women, and so much more. In this episode, we will focus on Britain of James I, and how this affected his young son Charles. On the 24th of March, 1603, Queen Elizabeth I, Gloriana herself, passed away. Her successor was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. The woman Elizabeth had kept under lock and key for 19 years and had finally executed. Her son, James VI of Scotland, succeeded her and became James I of England, Scotland and Ireland, the first monarch to do so. The succession to Elizabeth, which had caused so many worries and concerns over the decades, actually happened peacefully and smoothly. Even better, for longer than anyone could remember, a monarch had come to the throne not only with a male heir, but also a spare. This was a stark and welcome contrast to the multiple marriages of Henry VIII, the phantom pregnancies of Mary, and the worthless attempts to get Elizabeth to marry and have children. The cherry on the top for the people of England was that James himself was a Protestant, but it also appeared promising for the remaining Catholics in the country, as the new king was known for his religious toleration. The future was looking bright, but perhaps here at last was a monarch who could unite the Isles of Britain in religion, politics and its relationship with Europe. James travelled south from Edinburgh to London with dreams of the mythical King Arthur. He wished to unite the three kingdoms of England, Ireland and Scotland. Kingdoms which were separate in religion, parliaments, customs and had been at war with each other intermittently for as long as anyone could remember. The king himself said he wanted to create this perfect union which is made in my blood. He even had coins minted to emphasise the union. On one side of the new pound coin he had an image of himself, whilst on the reverse had the combined arms of England, Scotland, Ireland and France. This new coin would be called a Unite. His gaining both crowns would be a marriage between England and Scotland. He even went so far as to ban the name of the borders, the dangerous bandit country between the two countries. This vision of his was to make this island one nation, one country, have one language and most importantly to James, one religion. James, like his son Charles, who would succeed him, would have to tread very carefully where religion was involved. Religious wars still raged with ferocious regularity, and the Thirty Years' War, which was in flame Europe in 1618, would be a truly horrific conflict. One wrong step by the king, and the country could be plunged into a holy war. One of the first things James had to do was to sign the Peace Treaty of London in 1604, which would end the exhausting war against the Spanish. This conflict had been driving English foreign policy for 19 years, not to mention draining the stretched coffers of the treasury. England had been a Protestant and rebellious state amidst the Catholic powers of Europe since the Pope had excommunicated Elizabeth in 1570. The peace that James signed was crucial in his plans to make Britain both prosperous and above all peaceful. But the peace would not last. At the turn of the 17th century, religion was the most important thing in everyone's lives. From the greatest king to the lowliest peasant, how you worship God literally made the difference between you going to heaven or burning in hell for the rest of time. In England especially, Catholics were still seen as a huge threat. Yet Catholics looked at James' accession with some hope that he would ease the crippling restrictions and fines that had been imposed by the Tudor state under Elizabeth. And at the beginning of James's reign, it looked like this might just happen. But unfortunately for the Catholics, it was not meant to be. Even though James had assured the Earl of Northumberland, amongst others, that he would not persecute, as he put it, 
any that will be quiet and give an outward obedience to the law. But this was soon forgotten as incidents like the by plot, the pressure of his council and his wife, the queen, being sent a rosary by one of the Pope's spies made him continue the laws of persecution against Catholics. The continuation of the persecution would ultimately lead to the gunpowder plot. His dreams of peace were therefore dealt an early blow as the deaths of Winter, Catesby, Percy and Fawkes reverberated around the country. As a Protestant himself, James inclined himself towards high church doctrine. The low church Presbyterians, more numerous in Scotland, were not keen on bishops or interference from the monarch, and so were not close to James's heart. The high church where the congregation listened to and respected the clergy would therefore listen to and respect the king. After all, why shouldn't they? James believed he had been chosen by God to rule and to be obeyed, the divine right of kings. His right to rule also extended across the Irish Sea to the troubled lands of Ireland. This Catholic island had suffered heavily over the years from wars, persecution and colonisation of Protestants from England and Scotland. By 1607, many of the leading nobles in Ireland could not see a future anymore in their native land and so had exiled themselves to Spain. The so-called flight of the earls left a power vacuum, a vacuum that James had a plan for. James would begin his plantation plan immediately to fill the empty lands with English and lowland Protestant Scots, who in exchange for land would defend their newly gifted lands for at least five years. This unsettled land would rear up again when James's son was on the throne and would be a key factor in the commencement of the civil wars. But closer to home, how did James and his family cope with the joint kingdoms of Scotland and England? When James crossed the border, his family was well established. His eldest son, Henry, the Prince of Wales, was being brought up as a model prince, well-educated, sporting and handsome. He was a shining light for the future, not only for the Stuart line, but also for Britain. A lot was resting on the young prince's shoulders. He was genuinely seen as a future Protestant hero. His education itself was a cause of wonder amongst other royal courts, as he was being educated by the great philosopher king, James I. Yet despite these hopes, Henry was not the sharpest sword in the armoury, and despite his education and the efforts of his tutors, he fell ill in 1612. He rapidly grew worse and worse. He became bedbound as a raging fever took control. Physicians treated him with the very best of medicine at the time by placing a dead cockerel at his feet and putting split pigeons on his head. The illness, which was probably typhoid from swimming in the river, was a short one and he died. At a stroke, James's vision and the Stuart dynasty was in grave danger. Gone was the heir and now the future of James's Britain rested on the young shoulders of Prince Charles. James's grief was so total that he refused to go to Henry's funeral. Charles himself was born in 1600 and was at a very early age a worry and a disappointment. His early years were a painful experience for the young prince. When he was three, his family would be split apart as the majority of the family and the court travelled to London. Charles was not sent with them, for it was feared that he was so weak that he would not survive the journey. He was indeed a weak specimen. He was cursed with rickets as a child, a symptom of not getting enough vitamin D. As soon as he was able to stand, his legs were braced in irons to straighten out his feeble legs. If this wasn't painful and embarrassing enough, especially when placed next to your handsome and athletic brother, he had a stammer. His father genuinely despaired. How could Charles gain the respect he was due if he had a speech impediment? The king, his father, had a solution for the stammer. Simply cut the tendons beneath the Charles's tongue. Thankfully for the young boy, his guardian, Lord Fivey, managed to convince the king that this was not necessary. Charles would later try and manage his stammer himself by talking with small pebbles in his mouth. This young life was dealt blow after blow, born with bowed legs, traumatised by his stammer, 
losing his brother, who he idolised in 1612, suddenly having the huge weight of responsibility of becoming his father's heir, was then joined by him losing the companionship of his beloved sister. His elder sister Elizabeth was to be married to Frederick V, Count Palatine of the Rhine. It was as if Charles' world was falling down. Now we often see Charles, particularly in his later years, as vacillating, divering and weak-willed. Yet despite all the blows his younger years had suffered, he began to toughen up. He learned how to sword fight, he became a confident horseman and even regularly went on runs around St James's Park. As he grew in stature, so did his confidence. Although his stammer would plague him for the rest of his life, he managed to accept it and in times of great stress and danger, it actually left him. But nothing could help him conquer his deep disgust of his father's court. A court unlike the Tudor court, full of vice and unpopular favourites. Now monarchs, since anyone could remember, had always had favourites at court. And when they were selected well, it reaped real benefits. We only have to look back at James's predecessor Elizabeth and her favourites. Men such as Burley and Walsingham were true servants and achieved great successes for the monarch and the country. However, under James's rule, the term favourite soon took on other connotations. Within James's closest advisers, there were a disturbing number who had been chosen because they were young, male and attractive. It was plain to see for people of the court then, as it is to us now, that James was bisexual. In a period where sodomy was a capital crime, it may seem odd that the king was allowed to be so open about it. Yet the court and the country's leading nobles knew that James was the only real true successor to Elizabeth. After all, Parliament couldn't just try the king. James had the correct bloodline. He had two male heirs and above all, he was Protestant. These facts clearly made up for a lot, but not with Charles. He disliked his father's blatant sexuality, his overly friendly behaviour with young, handsome knaves, and his reckless expenditure, not to mention his regular desire to hunt and drink instead of conducting government business. But perhaps Charles's greatest problem with his father was the King's favourite, George Villiers, the future Duke of Buckingham. Villiers was educated for the life of a courtier. He danced beautifully, could fence and spoke French. King James was clearly besotted with him when he came to court. The King's attraction can be understood by a quote from the Bishop of Gloucester. He quoted, He was the handsomest bodied man in all England. His limbs so well compacted and his conversation so pleasing and of so sweet disposition. Villiers' rise through the ranks of the royal court was rapid. Funds were gathered to allow Villiers to have a new wardrobe, and pressure from other courtiers finally got him the coveted position of royal cupbearer. This trusted position allowed the holder to converse with the king himself. James was smitten by this beautiful vision at court. So much so, he helped Villiers up the greasy court pole. In 1615, Villiers was knighted as a gentleman of the bedchamber, which was rapidly followed by the post of Master of Horse. Soon after, he was raised to a Viscount, then an Earl, then a Marquis, and finally, in 1623, he was made the Duke of Buckingham. This was an incredible rise for Villiers, and at the time, his dukedom was the only one in England that was held by someone who was not a member of the royal family. Becoming a duke gave Villiers the ultimate opportunity of dancing with the now sole heir to the throne, young Charles, Prince of Wales. This allowed the two men to become firm friends, which would lead tragically to so much heartache and despair in the years to come. Villiers monopolised the king's time, took him away from government work and family time. James would call Villiers Steenie after St Stephen, who it was said had the face of an angel. Villiers was certainly not the only young male favourite at court, but he was certainly the one at the top in the king's affections. To dispel any fears, James spoke to the Privy Council in 1617. He wrote, 
You may be sure that I love the Earl of Buckingham more than anyone else, and more than you who are here assembled. I wish to speak in my own behalf, and not to have it thought to be a defect, for Jesus Christ did the same, and therefore I cannot be blamed. Christ had John, and I have George. Courtiers then and historians now can still argue about the king's sexuality. However, the letters between the two men are extremely revealing. The king, in writing to the Duke in 1623, wrote, God bless you, my sweet child and wife, and grant that ye may ever be a comfort to your dear father and husband. Buckingham wrote back just as affectionately, I naturally so love your person and adore all your other parts, which are more than ever one man had. I desire only to live in the world for your sake, and I will live and die a lover of you. Buckingham himself provides evidence, writing to James many years later, that he had pondered, whether you loved me now better than at any time, which I now shall never forget at Farnham, where the bed's head could not be found between the master and the dog. Even though disgusted by his father's blatant behaviour, if Charles wanted his father's attention and affection, he knew he would have to join this notorious pairing. So as he began to spend time with the king and Villiers on a day-to-day -day basis, he was given the embarrassing name of Baby Charles. Yet despite calling the heir to the throne Baby Charles, Villiers was a canny enough political operator to see which way the wind was blowing. He knew that James would not be around forever. And despite his close friendship with the king, Villiers knew he had enemies. Many at court were deeply jealous of Villiers' behaviour and also angry at the fact he controlled access to the king. Not only the access of others, but also the access Villiers had was under considerable scrutiny and rumour. We can get a good image of what kind of access was required by what was discovered during restoration work at Eight Fort Palace in Northamptonshire. Builders discovered a secret passage which connected Villiers' own room to the bedroom which was set aside for King James when he visited. Villiers may have been at the top but with so many enemies, if he wanted to survive when James died, Villiers knew he would have to have the support of the new king. In our next episode, we will be looking at how Charles's relationship with Villiers continued, and how Charles began to grow into his royal role. He will be trekking across Western Europe to gain the hand of a bride, the Spanish Infanta. If you missed our first episode on what we will be covering in this brand new series, click the link in the description box Below. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Please subscribe, and of course, God save the king.